Hello friends, your monk is back. Hope you're well and thriving and I hope your practice is doing well. So today I want to encompass um, a discussion around a majority of questions that I've been getting over the years and uh, more from lay people. Uh, monks don't really ask this question. Um, but th the question is, you know, looking for silver bullets in the practice, looking for, you know, if I just concentrate on this, this will be enough, or if I, if I do this, that'll be enough, and it's all about this and that. And I want to let you know, right? Now, you got to be careful because we have a conditioning. And from, from being kids, you know, we, we're taught a certain way of dealing with logic and reason. And uh, we've always got this mathematical process going on of one plus one equals two. And if we just isolate everything and simplify, uh, simplify it, and then we can target it and this and that. And I mean, that has its place. That has its place, right? And, and we've got to understand there's, there's horses for courses. There's logic, there's logic um, for, for, for appropriate situations like uh, when you own a house or you're renting a house uh, you have to pay bills and uh, you have to work and you have to organize there's time management financial management social management so you have to add it all together and spread your time across all these things um, you know family management you have to we have to do a lot of things we have to manage a lot of things right and when we have to manage a lot of things, this is where logic does help. Reason does help. Well, reason helps anytime. But logic does help because it helps you formulate a plan as to how to deal with the ongoing costs and on, you know, saving money or all the difficulties, all the things that are needed to be done every day in a, in a, I guess, in a normal everyday life, in normal everyday life, right? <clears throat> but I just can't stress enough how important difficulty and hardship is in this practice right and one thing that gets overlooked a lot i believe and i mean a lot is the difficulty and hardship a lot of the uh disciples of like what the buddha put himself through now the buddha left the palace right he had a child he left the palace he left a beautiful as the books are beautiful queen right he was a prince <clears throat> he left a a great, you know, a palace, mansion, whatever. Um, you know, he had concubine, he had a, a harem, I guess. He had, he had, you know, he had everything a man could possibly want, really. And, you know, don't start with the sexist crap and all that stuff and all that kind of stuff, right? I'm just talking about in those days in India. And if we want to talk honestly, there's a lot of countries in the world that where, where, where the princes, the, the 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 rulers, or they all have harems and concubines, and things. it still goes on today, right? So it's it's normal in some cultures. It's normal um, uh, up the top in a lot of places. I like me, I abstain. Like I, I don't follow all that, right? It's just how the world is. Whether it's good or not, I, I'm not here to judge that. Okay, horses for courses, right? So I don't want to steer away from all this silly sexist talk and all that kind of stuff because we're talking about buddhism right and i want to focus on dharma right i'm tired of all the political stuff trying to paint pictures in in dharma when we know that perceptions are impermanent our perceptions are not self so anyone with you know that kind mm -hmm. of political agenda i would ask you to reflect on uh perceptions perceptions are impermanent perceptions are not self Perceptions are also dukkha, right? Just to understand that, right? Sorry to point the finger. It's a bit of a bit of an old habit. Um, <clears throat> so coming back to hardship and difficulty in the Buddha, the Buddha left the palace and, ex and and went to rags, cut off his hair and wore rags, and and basically ate once a day or twice a day in the beginning, right? And he ate whatever was offered. Now consider that, right? my friends consider this right how difficult that is you got no home you're just sleeping willy-nilly anywhere right 
you're living outside, you're going into caves, you're going into forests. Again, I've spoken about jungles and forests and how dangerous they are. And in, in those times in India, there wasn't the deforestation we have today, I suppose. You know, they certainly weren't big roads like cars and like we have highways uh, today. You know, there wasn't that kind of stuff, right? So, so you know, there was there was animal, you know, wild animals everywhere. And uh, he, he exposed himself to that condition, right, to that situation, to that hardship, because he wanted to find out where real freedom is. Now, this is a thing that's really important. And, it, and it, you know, friends, you can't overlook this, right? And we talk about <clears throat> Ajahn Man in this tradition, Ajahn Man. And I talked about before how he used to expose himself to really, um, you know, really, uh, you know, harsh conditions, you know, in in cave, living in caves. Now, <clears throat> this is the thing, what you got to realize, right? Think about this. Now, he used to eat one or two handfuls of sticky rice, right, when he used to get it, right, in, in those days. And then, of course, some days he had got more, but when he was out in, in, in retreat, he used to stay in caves and, and stay in very isolated parts of uh, Isan, northern Thailand, right? Now imagine this. Imagine at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. you have two handfuls of rice and then for the next 24 hours you're sitting in a cave. Or you're sitting in, you know, or you're uh, under a sitting on, in, the, in a tree or even a hut. Consider that. Right? This is what he did. And this is what a lot of Arahants did, did. They exposed themselves to harsh conditions. Long time Mahabua was talking about how they used to just do uh, walking meditation as a, as a prerequisite to sitting meditation. Six hours a day. Six hours. Try it. Six hours. There's a certain level of standard here of practice, right? You have to understand this. We have to comprehend this, right? So... <clears throat> Not saying it's impossible, or but you know, if you think just reading suttas and then sitting on your and then going lying down on your couch and eating three times a day and having you know nice clothes and a nice apartment and watching TV or or you know having intimacy with your partner, you know sleeping in the bed with your partner, uh, being able to drink a bit of alcohol every day, all that kind of stuff, and you read a few suttas. You read a few discourses and you think, you know, your sati is strong enough and your concentration is strong enough. You've got another thing coming. Right? So, so we need to get our heads around this reality first. Okay? So our teacher exposed himself. The, the, the Lord Buddha exposed himself to the harshest conditions and the hard, harshest practice imaginable for those six years. And then finally he came to the realization of, of the middle path but the middle path right what is that right what is that it's he still didn't he still stayed in the robes so this is one thing if once the buddha attained why didn't he go back to the palace and resume his normal life right there's no because he cut off he cut off all the he, he cut off all the all the kilesa and he cut off all the desire right so he stayed in the robes, as many other arahants did. They stay in the robes, right? Because the harsh life, the difficult life, yields results. It yields results. The problem with comfort, right? The problem with having all the material things in your life and comfort zones and having everything where it should be and all these kind of things or having a lot of money and all these kind of choices and stuff and having a lot of money comes with its problems. Those, these comfort zones create laziness. It creates, it creates a, a, a tunnel for, for, for development of um, unwholesome, unwholesome actions. Right? Think about that for a moment. Laziness doesn't really yield anything. So the Arahants of old and the Arahants of our time, right? they expose themselves to harsh conditions. Look, Venerable Yunlokanata, who was a... Uh, an uh, Italian-American 
who ordained when in 1925, right? I think he ordained in the Burmese tradition. Um, it's been a long time since I talked about Venerable Lokanatha. He didn't lie down for 36 years, right? There are monks now um, in all parts of the world, right? And here in Thailand as well, where they haven't laid down for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And they're sitting in caves right now meditating, right? Which uh, I should be doing too, right? Although I'm, I need to be humble and realize that I need to do more work myself, right? I'm trying to do as hard as I can. Trying at it, trying to get to the goal as hard as reach the goal as 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 my and with all my force as possible, right? So you know there is this part where there's this saying that there's a lot of people that say, oh, it's not necessary to sit for long periods. It's not necessary to enter jhana. It's not necessary to eat once a day. It's not necessary to, to expose yourself to harsh elements. It's not necessary uh, to do this and to do that and to do this and to do that and to do this and to do that, right? Now, let alone what the texts say, what did Venerable Lokanatha say? He said, practice the... The 13 Dutanga, and I'll talk about another that another time. There's special uh, ascetic practices, right? Ajaman, long time Regardless of what this, the whether you think the, the Pali text is authentic or not, what did these people say? What did they say about the practice, right? They say the same things you know, exposing yourself, getting in there, digging hard, sitting for long periods of time. Usually, people who can't sit for long periods of time. So sitting for long periods of time is useless. But people who can sit for long periods of time say it's useful and it's beneficial, right? So in terms of 24-hour sati, <clears throat> in terms of right 24-hour right action, in, tw in terms of 24-hour right concentration, right? In, 20 in, in, case of, in the case of 24-hour right view, in like all the eight, eight factors, it's not just about that, it's also putting yourself into a situation where you can do that but most people can't handle it you know there are a lot of monks that have failed there are a lot of monks that haven't reached the target there are a lot of monks who have disrobed and they've given up right now when we talk you know some lay people say well lay people have been able to enter the stream and yeah of course but how many of them how many of them like we always hear about another pindika right in the text and we hear about uh, King Bimbisara and his wife, or Queen, uh, I forgot her name now. But, you know, a few, yeah. how many of them are there? How many lay people are there that have actually achieved stream entry? Right? You know, I, in the text, I haven't counted more than 100. Right? But look at their lives. Look, how, look at how disciplined their lives were. If you go to Savatya, Right, Anatha Pindika's park, right? The deer park at Isipatana, right? And, yeah, no, that's that's Migadaya. Now, if you go to Savati and yeah, Anatha Pindika's park, right? And if you ever go there in India, you'll see uh, his hut right next to the monastery that he used to that that uh, he gave to the Buddha, right? Where the Buddha spent about twenty five rains, right? At this, at uh, another Pindika's part in Savatiam, right? And you see, another Pindika had his own house right next to the to the temple. And from what I get from the text, he spent most of his days serving the sangha and being around the sangha and being around the Buddha, you know, being around Sariputta, being around Maha, uh, Maha uh, Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Mahamogalana, Venerable Kasapa. You know, amongst all the arahants, all day, every day, right? That's an exceptional layperson, right? So he again, he was exposed himself to that condition, right? He cut off a lot of things, and he basically spent a lot of his time in the temple, and and especially during the rains period. <clears throat> and so he put in the effort, but you know, how how are you doing that? Like, see, this is the question. Many people have asked me over time, oh, well, you know, what do you think about this sutta? What do you think about that sutta? What do you think about this stuff? Sure, the reflection is good, but have you been able to? Have you been able to enter jhana? Because that's a requirement. 
that's a requirement. Now, in this forest tradition that I follow, they say that you have to sit a minimum of three to four hours a day for a prolonged period of time to be able to enter samadhi, proper samadhi. Now, can you do that? Now, some people are going to say, oh, none of this is necessary, none of this is... Okay, that's fine. Horses for courses. You can criticize that as much as you like. But try to get into samadhi. Try to sit down and hit samadhi. Most people can't stand sitting more than an hour. Right? So, let alone sitting for three, four hours every day. So, the layperson can't really do that. You know, the common layperson can't really do that because you've got to work and you've got all your desires and you've got all your kilesa. You've got all your sensual, uh, sensual desires that you have every day <clears throat> that you want to attend to. You know, you've got your goals, your financial goals, all these kind of things which take in your mind elsewhere, your focus elsewhere. But you can't sit in solid for three or four hours a day and focus on one mantra or focus on Anapanasati deep and go all the way to cessation, you know, to dispassion and cessation and drop it all and go into the void or go into the fourth jhana, for example, keep it steady and then direct the mind to, to vipassana, to, to analyze dharma. To see Dharma. Like, can you do that? Or even the first jhana, we've talked about this before. Even the first jhana, if you're not a believer that fourth jhana, four jhanas are necessary, can you enter first jhana? Can you enter it by sitting an hour a day? It's hard to do, right? And a lot of meditative monks that I've spoken to, and I mean, these monks qualify. They can sit for 20 hours straight, right? When at will. Right? I know a lot of these monks in these in these in these parts, and they say, no, you can't really develop it that way. Right now, if you've got a stock solid practice where you're sitting an hour in the morning, sitting an hour at night, and you're doing that consistently all the time, and you're able to do that over a few years, yeah, there's a possibility you you might hit it. But you've got to be you've got a very you've got to have a staunch discipline to be able to do that, and not many lay people can do it. Right. I mean, I've been sitting in this temple since November last year. And we have a lot of lay people come here, but I haven't been able to see anyone sit for three hours straight. I tried, it with, I tried to sit with some lay people here um, some time ago for three hours. They couldn't do it. Right? They couldn't do it. I sat there for three hours. You know, after the three hours, I asked if all of them were gone or they were all lying down or getting up and walking around. They couldn't do it, right? Just that's three hours. So, so difficulty and hardship is something that the Buddha exposed himself to on purpose. And so, so did a lot of the Arahants, right? A lot of them. Ajahn Man, who's our champion in the Dharma Yut tradition and his disciples are our champions, right? You, ha you, have a, you, you hear their stories and what they exposed themselves to, okay? So they were regarded as arahants and, or achieved beings or some that they have gone very far or practiced well. And I'm just repeating what's, what's out there already. I'm not making a statement that I have witnessed this or that um, I know. I'm just going by what um, the consensus is here in the Sangha here. Right? But you know, they did not eat, uh, live easy lives. Right? They did not live easy lives. They exposed themselves to very harsh conditions. Now I know monks right now who are sitting all day, all night, just under, you know, in in a in a in a shack with some with some with some uh, with a tin roof, you know, with a tin roof and just a few few boards protecting themselves and just like a little glot, like a little protection net, protecting themselves just from you know the obvious you know, barrage of mosquitoes that come. But there are monks that, that, that even fight that, that don't even have mosquito use mosquito nets under the trees and they sit outside willy nilly, right? So this is what this is the kind of fundamental that I want you to understand, the difficulty that that a lot of the Arahants and a lot of well practiced uh, individuals have exposed themselves to. Because when you expose yourself to that difficulty and hardship, you, it's hard to get lazy and it keeps you awake and it keeps you focused. And there, there's a good reason why we live that way. There's a good reason why um, the Buddha says, you know, the, 
you know, the life of a monk is, is very good. It's very wholesome. And it's also very beneficial because you're, you're cutting off as much as possible through the rules at the beginning. Um, you're cutting off all, as much distractions as possible. But then people think that's really easy. I've seen, I've seen many monks, even myself at times, where you think, okay, it's all cut off. I've just had my meal now. I can just sit here and just go for it. Try it. Just try it. And you know that until the next day, you won't eat for 24 hours. So that's like your little time where you go out on the, and for arms round. But until then, you don't leave your spot. Now try it. Try it. Yeah, try it. Don't try it just once, because once or twice is a novelty. Do it over a prolonged period of time. See how long you last for. Most people can't last. You know, we see it all the time. The monks disrobing all the time, even after 30, 40 years, after 20 years, after 10 years, after one year. We see it all the time. Now, I don't want to jinx myself. I don't want to say anything about the future. Like I've said in previous videos, I don't want to be overconfident. I don't want to say anything. I don't know what will happen tomorrow, right? But my wish is to die in the robes. <clears throat> but we have to see what happens tomorrow. I don't know. But the, the, the idea is to understand that <clears throat> if you think just reading a discourse every day and, uh, and you know, sitting a little bit and, and not doing much else... <clears throat> is going to take you to full arahant, to full realization. Well, I beg to differ. You know, again, I can't paint the picture black for you or anyone. I'm not, I'm not the god of Buddhism. I'm not the authority, right? I can't tell you or anybody how it is. Good luck is what I'm saying to you, you know? Um, and I mean that, I mean that well. But from my opinion, you know, at the risk of sounding and looking and <clears throat> negative, I don't see how it can happen, you know, because the sati is not there 24 hours a day. There's the muscles not there, the concentration's not there. There's so many things that are missing, and you're getting caught up in all the distractions of the world. It's hard to do it even as a monk, right? Where even when you're following the vinaya as much as possible, you see monks getting getting caught up in in certain addicted to certain things, and you know they get lost in work or they try to avoid it. And, See it every day. <clears throat> See it all the time. We, we're all we're all because we're battling with our own distractions, right? But at least we're in a situation where we've put ourselves. You know, there's there's a structure there that you know only lets us get get away if it's so far, right? <clears throat> but as a layperson, there's no there's no bounds. There's no limits. You know, there's no limits, right? You can walk down the street and go anywhere you want, right? That's the difference of living in a temple or living as a monk in a, in a, um, in a, in, in like a, in a rural place or so, or even in a city monastery. But you can't go out. I mean that that boundary protects you from from really getting into you know getting into the unwholesome. But as a layperson, you have to protect yourself even more. So to me, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, unless you expose yourself to hardship and difficulty, what's teaching you? Because hardship and difficulty is the best teacher. When you're in a difficult situation, you see dukkha. That's the other thing that I want to <clears throat> touch on. Sometimes it's kind of like um, before I was a monk, I spent, I used to work in, uh, I spent some time, used to go once a month to and work in a drug and alcohol rehab center in Australia. I'm not going to name it. I'm not going to say which state, anything, right? Those who know, know. But you know, the counsellors there, which at the time were AA, right, would always say, you've got to stop going to the same pubs. You've got to stop hanging out in the same streets. You've got to pick up and move out and start again as a begin as as like as a as a as a uh, as a fundamental. It doesn't that's not just it, but that's the start. That's like the beginning step is you need to rid yourself, get yourself out of that environment first. Right? Then You've got to clean yourself up, like, uh, you know, work out, eat well, um, start sleeping, um, you know, don't go out, blah, 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 right? Get a job, study, empower yourself, right? So, but the first step usually is to pull out of that environment, to get out of that toxic environment, 
first of all. Every, things that remind you of all the, the, you, the toxic clicks that, you know, that might set you off in that direction, right? <clears throat> so in terms of comprehending dukkha, if you can't, hardship will make you see it. When you're sitting on the couch comfortable and you're sleeping and it's, you got your blanket over yourself, you got your remote control to your TV and, uh, you know, you can just go to the fridge and get your nachos or get your corn chips or get your salad or whatever whenever you get return back to the TV on your days off. And I'm talking as a single man, but as a family, you know, you're just sitting around having fun, uh, you know, watching videos or playing sport together and having a lot of fun. I'm not criticizing it, by the way. I'm just saying in terms of this path, I'm not talking about normal life. Got no problem with normal life. Got no problem with that. If that's what you want to do. Um, but we're talking about the Buddhist goal here. We're talking about cessation of dukkha. And I'm just trying to get to a react, give every, give myself and everybody else a reality check here. Right? When you're in difficult situation, like yesterday, for example, I, the, I just walked, I, was, I came back to my, um, my hut. I walked, tried to go to the toilet, and um, a wasp nest was just above me. These were brown wasps. They're about an inch or so in size. And I came down and I got bitten three times, twice here and one in the back, right? It, and everything was, and I was in a pretty relaxed mo mo um, uh, mood, etc. And I got bitten. And I had to run the toilet, had to run back, and I had to put balm on it. The last twenty four hours, I had to lie down last night because I was feeling a bit queasy, right? Um, and uh, you know that's dukkha right there. You know, no control of the situation. Little things like this. Little things like this, believe me or not, believe it or not, little things, little experiences like that really show you the the nature of impermanence and the, the, the nature of dukkha, the how unpredictable things can, uh, are and how things can go wrong that quick in your life, how things can turn and go for the worse that quickly, right? These situations, um, hardship and difficulty really um, helps you to hone your focus, it really helps you to see how difficult it really is. Like when you're out here in the heat, the height, and the mosquitoes, and all the other insects, um, and and you have to work, and you have to uh, sit and meditate, and you're sweating and sweating and sweating, the, the pain from the feelings when you try to sit still for a long period of time, or for when you're walking for a long period, really show you the dukkha. You really smell the body, you see how foul the body is from the sweat, and uh, you know, you start to study dukkha. You start to comprehend what the thing is. But when you're distracted and you go out through the senses into the world and you go into sens sensual um, comforts or you know tangibility things that are material, material, uh, <clears throat> tangible, sensual feelings and all those into that domain, right? Um, it's hard to to reel it back pull yourself back and see the dukkha in there, right? It's really hard to. That's why they say it's hard to see dukkha in heaven because you're too busy enjoying yourself. When you're enjoying yourself all the time, it's hard to see It's hard to see where the, where the stress is, right? But you will see it if you're, if you're intelligent enough because that even that enjoyment is not long-lived and there's always a price to pay. There's always a check. that you, There's always a payment. So you see all these rich people on their yachts and things like that. <clears throat> But there's a price to pay at the end of the day. You know, the owner is always sitting there, yeah, you know, millions of dollars, millions of dollars, but he knows his, that owner, whether it's he, she, they, whatever, um, the way, you know what, that person, right, that person uh, at the end of the day has to sign all the checks to pay for all the bills, right? So they can't rest. They know they've got to get the money for the next trip or for you know to keep funding that yacht or that lifestyle and that in itself is stressful because you can't really relax even when you've got that money you see this every day with people that have got tons and tons of money they don't relax because they've got a they've got a lifestyle to support you know they've got a they've got a monthly nut they've got to crack right as one of the new york terms i learned when i lived there right so these are the things right to to, to comprehend dukkha Right, the Buddha, you know, he he left the palace because he said this is too comfortable here. There's something underneath this that's not right. You know, I'm not free here, even with all these pleasures, but I don't feel free. 
I don't, there's no freedom here. So he exposed himself to harsh conditions to study and see. So even when you're learning, you know, something worldly like a, like a craft or a profession or a trade or whatever it is, you still have to sacrifice a lot. You, you, you expose yourself to hardship. And I've talked about the whole, for example, if you want to become a gold medalist, if you want to win a gold medal at the Olympics, you have to expose yourself to an extreme amount of hardship and difficulty in the worldly sense to, to be able to achieve it because you have to be you have to be at an advantage you have to be a step ahead of the competition and sometimes it's re those real subtle little things that you will see <clears throat> through hard work and effort that help you get that edge <clears throat> unless you won't sin that's why they say experience always beats the rookie right rookies can have some luck from time to time but experience beats it all the time but in terms of, uh, you know, sports and not necessarily youth, youth plays a lot in sports, right? But then again, your youth is impermanent. So only, you only have a window of time, right? So all these subtleties are learned, you know, through hardship, through difficulty. You know, they're the two best teachers there are. And Kanti as being one of the astute qualities, Kanti being patient perseverance. That, you know, when you're going through hardship, it teaches you to persevere and, and, and patiently, right? So, you know, the questions that I get, right? The questions that I get, I appreciate your questions. Don't take this as an attack or me saying, don't ask me any questions. But it's just, I'm, what I'm addressing today is the common questions that I get asked frequently, right? Frequently over the years. So I'm addressing it now. It's just that come to realization that, you know, if you're trying to win a gold medal, I've said this before in a previous video, if you're trying to win a gold medal at the Olympics, you need to be realistic about what you need to do and what's involved. A plan is necessary. A strategy is necessary. A devotion is necessary. Discipline is necessary. Sacrifice is necessary. All right? Now, we're talking about going to the state of deathless now. We're not talking about, uh, <laughs> you know, climbing Mount Everest. That pales in comparison, right? Because you can climb Mount Everest in a month or so. You know, this takes years. It took the Buddha six, the Buddha six years. Now, of course, there are a lot of Arahants that were after hearing the Buddha, they were able to, 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 to realize there and then real quickly. But there must have been a prerequisite there before. There must have been some hard work done before, right? So, yeah, again, it's not, I don't have pinpoint accuracy and I don't have the one plus one equals two solution or the silver bullet solution. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of factors, there are a lot of conditions that come into play, there are a lot of variables, a lot of angles to this, right? But at least don't kid yourself into thinking that, uh, you know, just, uh, just reading some discourses and things like this, you know, it's, it's enough. It's not enough, right? However, is a positive, now, devil's advocate and being a hypocrite to myself, is it better to read some discourses and meditate a little bit than doing nothing? I suppose so. Is it better to go on 10-day uh, workshops once a year than doing nothing? Yes, I suppose so. I suppose so. Right? But in the end, you know, if you're talking to some like a serious um, athlete and you're talking to an ad hoc, like a, a hobbyist athlete, you're going to get two different answers. The serious athlete would say, well, why waste your time when you can, when you should just devote yourself? And, you know, the hobbyist would say, well, you know, I don't want to win a gold medal. I'm just doing it for fitness. Fair enough. Fair enough. Again, whatever floats your boat. But people ask me about realization. I keep saying to them, well, well, the way I reflect on it, the way, the, why have I exposed myself to this condition? Because I look at the story of Ajahn Man, which is one of the reasons why and the main reason why I, I ordained is his story, where he exposed, he exposed himself to harsh, harsh and difficult conditions. That inspired me, 
that gave me hope that okay so if i detox out of this if i go through all this effort and i put myself there maybe i've got a chance right okay maybe i have a fighting chance but that's what these people did right if you want to follow the greats of life you have to understand there were big sacrifices they made sacrifices a lot of these big greats you look at any great person that you look up to whether it's even your father your mother your brothers your sister your uncles your aunties or someone um, that's not part of the not your blood family but were great in society look what they went through have a look they had that there was a price to pay no matter to get to greatness of any kind there's pride there's a price to pay there's a sacrifice right and this is the point I'm trying to get through today, right? It's kind of like, if you're, how much are you willing to sacrifice? If you're not willing to sacrifice and risk it, then what, what, what profit do you expect to gain? Right? So this, you know, you need to, we need to become realistic about, this. if the Arahants went through, you know, a lot of hard practice, if the modern day Arahants, and I'm talking from in the last thousand years, Right, if the modern day Arahants, you listen to their what what they went through, and you and you and and you read the story of how astute they are and what they developed, <clears throat> regardless of the Pali text, regardless of what the Majjhima Nikaya says, you listen to the people that actually went beyond. Right, you you hear their story. It's in story of incredible struggle. Incredible struggle. Right. Now, I meet senior monks here regularly, and they tell me their stories. You know, they tell me what they what they do every day. They tell me what they go through. It's not normal. It's not like your normal lifestyle, right? Especially in Theravada, in this tradition, where a lot of these monks, they eat just a few handfuls of food every day. Then they go out, they do the chores. Uh, it's hot here in the, the common day. I mean, we're monks, we're exposed to it, but... We're exposed to harsh conditions on purpose, right? But, you know, these people, these, these senior monks are 80, 90 years of age and they're still doing it. And they still be able to maintain six, seven hours of sitting and everything else and poise and everything else in that condition. <clears throat> and so this is the other side of it. You're in a really comfortable home, aren't you? Right? You've got a nice couch, a nice bed, you know, a nice lounge, whatever, right? Why can't you sit for three hours straight in that condition? Right? What's your excuse? Why do you have to eat so much when you know you can just get it so easily, right? <laughs> okay, so, you know, keep your practice up. Don't be discouraged by what I said. This was, this is a, this was a discussion on getting, getting your mind, um, hopefully getting our minds around the reality of the difficulty of the greats in the Sangha and what they went through. And that's what this discussion was about, right? That was what I was aiming to, aiming to. hopefully I expressed it well enough. If not, um, yeah, please let me know, right? Feedback is appreciated. So, you know, Ajahn Man, Long Tamahabua, I talk about these two because they, they were two of my, uh, two of my giants uh, in this tradition that I really followed passionately uh, before I became a monk and in the first few years too and I still do I still do I, I keep looking at their their example of how they what they did you know, six hours of uh, I've done four I've been able to do four hours of uh, med um, uh, walking meditation right I've been able to hit four hours you know wow you know it's hard right six hours you know, no problem. I mean, that kind of effort is, is staggering. That kind of effort is staggering. It's kind of mind-blowing how, you know, what they were able to do. You know, Ajahn Man staying in the caves with tigers around and these caves are stenchy caves with scorpions and spiders and centipedes and bats and rats and snakes and, and whatever else, bears and whatever other insects I can't think, mosquitoes and caves are damp and there's, there's a stench 
in a lot of camp uh, uh, caves in the old day caves right i'm not talking about refur refurbished caves right you know you look at he was able to stay there for weeks on end and eat very little and sit and concentrate he was able to penetrate the dharma all right that's what i look at when i look at okay right effort in my view that's what i see is right effort what you what you need to expose yourself to and uh you know, I haven't reached that level, but that's what these people did, right? That's the Arahant standard, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if you just think, okay, I want to just fall into the stream, I want to enter the stream and that's enough. Well, that's a hard call too. I mean, how do you hone your right view and still be distracted in, in sensuality? There needs to be a certain level of discipline there, right? So... Actually, I think I'm done today. I think I've talked enough. May grow in Dharma. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share with your friends.